Coaching Soccer Weekly, episode 351, 4v4. Entertaining, educational, and inspiring soccer content to help make you a more effective coach, player, or soccer parent. Hello, and welcome back to Coaching Soccer Weekly, presented by World Class Coaching. My name is Sega Rabinovich, and this is the podcast devoted to bringing you cutting-edge methods, techniques, and tactics for coaching soccer. It doesn't matter if you're an experienced coach who has been training teams for many years, or if you're new to coaching and working with the team for the very first time. There's something we can all do to take our coaching to the next level. Welcome back to the show. It's Tuesday, and it, we had a long weekend. Uh, Saturday, we had one game. Sunday, we had another game. And then right after that game was the Team Canada game. So as I normally do, I'll talk about things as they happened throughout the weekend, starting with Saturday. And after that, we'll go into the 4v4s and how we're using that to teach our players to understand formations and tactics and things like that in an environment which I actually really like. So let's get into it. Saturday, our 2010s played. This week, I made sure that it was just our 2010s that came. We didn't need any 2011s other than our goalkeeper. Our 2011 goalkeeper has been absolutely amazing, and all of our goalkeepers have been amazing. The saves that they make, um, it, it's very different to have someone in the back that you rely on. Um, I think for the first part of the academy's history, so first three years, we really didn't have a goalkeeper. And that ended up with just goals and goals being scored on us. And I'll talk about the Sunday game. Uh, but Saturday, to be honest, he didn't really have to do much. I don't think he made a single save. Uh, he didn't need to. Uh, we were, we just didn't really, they didn't have any chances. So we ended up winning that game 2-0. But I guess the theme of this weekend was winning, but still a lot of work to do. <laughs> um, the team that we beat, uh, we should have beat by a lot more we should have had a lot more shots so the shooting part of the game is still something that we need to work on and I didn't think that it was going to happen overnight so the goals that we're scoring they're great goals they're beautiful goals um, the goals especially in the 2010 game were pretty good but we need more chances and we need to start understanding how to play in that final third. And that's really why I started doing the 4v4 because it's a really great way to teach our players how to play in that final third. And that's what I'll go into uh, later on in the show today. So again, you know, they played okay. Um, but we need more chances. We have to create more chances. We have to take more shots and that's going to continue with our practice, the shooting practices that we do, and now the 4v4. So, uh, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Our 2014s were the only ones that played on Sunday, 2014-15 team. And we played the same team. So we're essentially we're playing the three teams, I think twice or three times uh, before... January and we're just playing those three teams so we're kind of rotating and we've already played this team that we played I think we've played them twice maybe even so we beat them with the exact same score 7-1 and I thought we played I thought we played again just like the 2010s I thought we played okay but Unlike the 2010s, shooting and scoring was not a problem. We ended up winning like 7-1 or something like that. The problem was understanding the shape and moving the ball from side to side, which is a really hard concept to teach 2014s and 15s. And when I say that, I don't, I, I, I'm really careful because it's not impossible. 
it's something that I've taught my U9s, my U8s before. So it's not impossible. But what makes it difficult is the types of 2014s and 15s that we have in the group. These are players that have been with me for a very long time. Most of them have, I mean, the player who's been there the longest has been there for maybe four years. Yeah, so I, I've had him since he was five years old. And the other ones have been there at least since last winter, last summer. Um, so we have a really good group of kids, but what they've been focusing on, and this is every single practice, is 1v1s. So the idea to pass the ball, the idea to get into a shape, is not something that they're used to. And I think that's okay, right? If you watch that game back, their fearlessness, their bravery, their creativity within the 1v1s are at such a high level for their age that I really don't want to take away from that. So the way that I'm coaching them isn't you have to pass the ball, you have to move the ball from side to side. It, it's not that. It's if you see a 1v1 go, attack. If you think you can beat players, attack them. But if you're overwhelmed at any point, that's when we should start looking at other options. We should look to switch the ball because at this age and I would say even at older ages teams tend to shift over and just kind of cluster up so if you just shift the ball to the other side the other winger the other defender they'll have space to attack and we had players dribble through the whole team and you know as a coach who loves tactics dribbling through the whole team is not how I want my teams to play. But this is a brand new type of player that we've created. And watching the Team Canada games, it's such a valuable player. And watching the World Cup in general, these are the players that are lacking in the world stage. And the players that are 1v1 specialists, they're the ones that get the headlines they're the ones that get the big moves to big clubs, and they're the stars of the team. I mean, how often do you hear about the passers of the team, right? It, they just don't get the same amount of respect within the media, right? Within the team, they're so valuable because, you know, as a forward, as a 1v1 specialist, you want the ball. So you want someone who can find you in tight spaces when you make runs, whatever that is. So for me, the players that we've trained in that 2014 group, their self-confidence to attack 1v1s, even our goalkeeper, he beat a player. Um, he's so calm with the ball. He doesn't panic. And he made... And this is all on Instagram, by the way. Uh, if you look up Gladiator Soccer Academy, it's all one word. I put in the goalkeeper highlights. He is eight years old, and he is diving and making saves. It's ridiculous. So to have that goalkeeper in the net and have that peace of mind of we have someone in the back that we can trust, that not only can we trust him, but he's a leader. He will yell at the defenders. He will give them instructions as he should. And that's what I've been missing, right? The older players, our older goalkeepers, they make fantastic saves, but they've been trained just as goalkeepers. Their footwork, their 1v1s, their passing, it's not that great. Our 2011 goalkeeper, such a good goalkeeper. He's so gifted when it comes to shot stopping. But he panics when the ball comes to him in his feet. He usually just one times and kicks it away. But because of 2014, because he started with me, I want to say about two years ago, we started training him as a player. So he is very confident 1v1 and when you pass him the ball. And that's, that's different. That's a different type of player. And a lot of the practices, he goes, you know, can I play out? And the answer is yes. Yes, you can. You know, go out, play with your feet, beat players, take risks, go for it. 
And when he's in the net, he's got so much time on the ball that it's just not a big deal for him. So overall, and, and I told the players this, you know, they did well. But the thing that was missing was understanding their positions, understanding their formation, how they move with relation to each other, how they help each other off the ball. Because that's really what you're doing. If you don't have the ball, all you're doing is finding a way to get it. That's really it, right? Either you're finding a way to get it or you're helping your teammates by creating space. So I made a point. I brought the team. Very rarely um, do I have after game talks. I don't usually talk to the team after the game. Uh, I don't think it's necessary, uh, honestly, um, especially the way that we play and what we're trying to emphasize. You know, it, it's heat of the moment. And you know, the last thing you want to do is say something that's, that you're going to regret later especially if your team has lost that game, that's when you're the most heated and you can say something that, you know, you really don't want to. Um, with the older kids, now we're starting to stretch after the game, so then I'll have a little conversation, but very rarely do I want to talk about the game. So I called them in after, and, and I made sure to do this in front of the parents so the parents were around because, to be honest, the parents needed to hear this. Um, you know, and, and I said exactly what I said now, you know, played well, uh, 1v1's fantastic, really great. But what we're missing now is understanding our shape, understanding how to move together as a team, where we should be in support and all that. And I said, I want everyone to be there on Monday night in the Zoom call when we analyze the game. And that was yesterday. And that was probably one of the best Zoom sessions, tactical Zoom sessions that we've had. And here's why. Here's what I did. So, first of all, this show is sponsored by VO. <laughs> and VO is what we use, right? So VO records the games, and then it goes up, uploads, highlights, things like that. And it's a really great tool. So we used VO, and we sat down, well, I sat down on my chair, and did the uh, Zoom session. And here's what happened. I made sure to have, I think we had almost all of the 2014s. And then on top of that, we had the rest of the academy. So we had 2013s, 2012s, 2011s. There weren't any 2010s, but there were a lot of older players who have had years of experience playing 7v7. And here's what I said. Before we analyzed the game, before we said anything, before we started, at the very, very beginning, I told everyone this. I said, today... I want you to be very active, especially the older players. I'm going to pause the game at certain moments, and I want you to tell me what's wrong. And I want the older players who have been through this to really help the younger players understand where they should be. So we had a lot of player participation. I was able to call on players because they were all there. And all we did was watch the 2014 game and analyze it from just a tactical point of view because that's really important, you know. Players need to understand, even though I love that they're selfish with the ball at this age and really good at 1v1s, they have to understand that they're still a part of a team, that when they don't have the ball, they have to be in a situation where they can help their teammates. Because it's not seven against one, it's seven against seven, right? So we need to make sure that we're helping each other. And that was really the focus of the tactical session on Monday. So that was Sunday morning, and after that, right after that, was the Canada-Croatia game. Now, I said before the World Cup started that it doesn't really matter how Canada play, because it's already a success that they're there. And now I've changed my mind, which I'm allowed to do. I'm very disappointed at what went on and I'm disappointed because I felt like we were the better team especially during that Belgium game and it just gave me flashbacks of the academy and how there are times where we're the better team and we lose and it's, it's frustrating not because I lost but because I know we deserve that win. 
it just feels like a chance that we had and it's gone and I feel like the World Cup could have been a chance to really show everyone how good we are but instead we're 0-2 and, and at this level winning matters that's what it's about when you're going into a tournament so let's talk about the Croatia game. I don't know if you saw it. Um, but within the first minute, we score a goal. We're up 1-0. And then for the rest of the half, something happened right after that goal that made me just think to myself, I actually think it would have been better if they scored first. Because from my point of view, here's what happened. We scored a goal against Croatia, and then we kind of sat back and allowed them to play. And you can't do that to Croatia. You can't allow top teams to play. The reason we were so successful against Belgium is because we went right at them. We didn't give them time to breathe. We didn't give them time to work, like nothing. We were on them the whole time. So... That first goal, I actually think hurt us. Now, I don't know. Um, I'm not with the players. I don't know how tired they are from the Belgium game. I don't know the heat. I don't know what's going on. I don't know tactically. I don't know the physical condition. Like, I, I don't know. But from my point of view, it was disappointing that we didn't go after this team and end up losing 4-1 anyway. How much worse would it have been if we actually pressured them? You know, so that, that was something very frustrating. And at the end of the first half, I said, we can't win this game, not if we keep playing like that. And the second half, the rest of the game, it just didn't really look like Canada. What I most liked about Canada is the ability to compete. We would go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the U.S., Mexico, and we wouldn't care. We would go after them, and we just didn't play the Canadian game, right? When you think of Canadian athletes, and you think of you know hockey and, and hockey in Canada, you don't think of you know just these polite, kind people walking about, you know, saying, "Oh, sorry for hitting you." No. These hockey players hit you hard, right? As athletes, we go hard and we hit you. And we make sure that you understand that you will not bully us around. I think the Canadian identity in that regard has always been feeling like an underdog. You know, we're in the shadow of the U.S. for a lot of sports, and we don't like that. You're kind of like that younger brother, right? Always trying to show up your older brother. And when you're competing against your older brother, one against one, you go after him. You hit him. You let him know that, hey, you might beat me, but I'm not going to make this easy for you. And I just felt like Croatia was, it felt too easy. It felt like, okay, let's kind of, let's let them do their thing and we can just sit back and hopefully defend it. And don't get me wrong, I understand parking the bus, I understand defending, I, I get it. But if it's, it, it just hasn't been our identity. So why start at the World Cup to do that? It's not something that we've practiced a lot. We haven't played against, you know, the Croatias, the Belgiums, the Brazils of the world that often. So to go in with a completely different game plan that we haven't been practicing, I don't know about that. I would have rather lost that game going, okay, we fought. We fought hard, and we, get, we got our respect, and that's fine. And that's what happened in Belgium, right? We fought hard, and we lost, and that's okay, right? But to lose the way that we did, ooh, that that wasn't okay. So anyway, that's my two cents about it. 
don't get me wrong. I'm very proud of this team. I still believe in John Herdman. And I don't know if you heard about his comments and stuff like that, but I thought it was absolutely ridiculous what the media made out of it. Like, the guy's in the moment. I think the only mistake he made in that moment was having a conversation with his team on the field so other people could hear. But there have been a lot worse things said in changing rooms, and that's where that should have been. But, I, you know, you're at the end of the game and, and you say things and – and you're trying to pump your team up. That's the job of the coach, you know? So, I don't know. Um, I still think he's one of the best coaches. He's the only coach to bring a men and a women's team into the World Cup. He's completely changed Canadian soccer, and without him, we wouldn't be where we are. Uh, and he's changed a lot of these players' lives. After this tournament, a lot of players are getting moves to big clubs. And this is now going to be a Canadian team that people are going to be scared of moving forward. These players now have four more years to play at a top level, which a lot of them are going or making moves to top clubs. And now what you saw in these World Cup games with Canada is you saw Alfonso Davies dribble through teams. You saw Buchanan do the same thing. And I bet in four years where our players are going to have weekly games against these top players in the world and we go up against another Croatia, we'll be fine, right? But we got to take it to them like we have to. So let's talk about 4v4s. Let's talk about, first of all, why I like them. There's a, really a lot to go into with 4v4s. Um, we can focus on offense, defense, and then within that, there's a lot of different points that you can make with your team. But the reason that I like 4v4 is because that's, at least for me, the basic shape that shows up the most when we play. So we play in diamonds. So that's four players that make a diamond. You can argue, I guess, that you know, you play triangles as well, but we actually don't play with as many triangles. And when I say triangles, I would equate that more for the 11 v 11 game. I feel like there are more triangles than diamonds. And I know you can say that, yes, a diamond and within a diamond, there's a triangle. I get that. But when I create shapes for tactics, and which in turn affects my formation, I build it with the idea that I'm building a lot of different uh, diamonds. And that's why we do the rondos, because the rondos have a large impact on the way that we play. So if we didn't play in diamonds, then the rondos really wouldn't have an effect because we play those 4v1s. So I'm not going to talk about the basic stuff of the rondos because I've done that enough. So I'll say the points, but I'm not going to talk about them within the tactical understanding of the 4v4 game, right? So going into the 4v4 games that we have, our players understand support, advice for this foot losing defender. That's, that's the minimum to get into 4v4. Once they understand that, now we're ready for 4v4. So let's talk about, first of all, why I love the 4v4 so much. I really like the idea of the three players at the top. So a player on the wing, on both sides, and then a player in the center. And that shows up in just about every part of where we play. So for example, we play... Uh, 5v5 with our 2010s, our under-13 team. And that shows up with our goalkeeper, our two defenders, and our center midfield. And what that turns into, once we're in the opponent's half, and I'll get into that a little bit later, is our two wingers and our center midfielder as well. It shows up within our uh, 7v7, right? The exact same way goalkeeper two defenders one center mid and then it also shows up 
as a center mid, which is our goalkeeper, and then our two wingers, and then the top players are forward. It shows up in 9v9 as well, right? So it's the exact same thing. So in 9v9, it just shows up more often. Same thing with the goalkeeper, two defenders, center mid, but it also now shows up with our fullback. Fullback is the winger. The player that's at the bottom is our defender. The player on the left side or on the weak side is our center mid. And then the top player is our attacking mid, right? So you can see that there's a lot of different ways. And this goes back to the diamond that this shows up in the game. And we have to start to understand how players work in relation with each other. And that's really the focus of 4v4. So for the sake of the 4v4, you could do it with uh, wide space, half space, center space, right? Dividing it into those spaces. And I think that's really the way to go. Um, that's how I personally have done it. But you can also just divide it into two spaces. You could do a wide space and a center space and then a wide space, sorry, and then, sorry. <laughs> A wide space, center space, and then another wide space, right? So you could do it that way. So it would go wide space, center space, center space, wide space. That makes sense. Okay. So let's talk about how the instructions, first of all, and the way that we play uh, within the attacking part of the game. Okay. So I, I just want to make it clear, though, we're, I'm pretty new at this. So I'm still figuring stuff out. As, uh, as we're going. So as we start, the goalkeeper has the ball. Once the goalkeeper has the ball, the forward or center mid, that's who I essentially think that player is, and he can also be a forward in certain situations too. They're going to go past half, and they're going to go really far uh, into the other team's half. Now, what I like about the 4v4 is that every player picks up a player. So we're playing man-to-man. -man. So the defensive team have their player who's at the top. And I'm going to start calling this uh, the, the forward. Okay, let's just call him the forward for this. Uh, we'll have left wing, right wing, and then goalkeeper. Those are the positions that we play. So the opposing team's forward has a decision to make they could either press the goalkeeper and if they press the goalkeeper what that did was it opened up our forward okay i'm going to give you a second to think about that for a second okay if our forward goes up and their forward doesn't stay with our forward and instead presses the goalkeeper our forward now has space and you might think to yourself okay this is not realistic it's very realistic because where we want our forward to be is actually by themselves in between the two defenders. So that's a position that hopefully they're going to hold. Now, because the forward is pressing the goalkeeper, our forward now has to find a passing lane because ideally the only way to press is to cut the passing lane or else you shouldn't be pressing. So that player now has to move into the half space or just move over a little bit so that they can receive the ball. Now, this is really powerful. When we make passes to try and score, what we want to do is we want to set the goal scorer so that they have an angle on the goalkeeper. Now, if you receive a ball from the same space that you are in, so let's take that goalkeeper and forward, for example. If the goalkeeper is in the center space and the forward is in the center space and the ball is passed to the forward, the forward is going to have to do some sort of turn or uh, something to shoot the ball. And we don't want that. That takes too much time. We want the goal scorer to receive the ball and within a maximum of two touches, hopefully and ideally one touch that they can shoot. And the way to do that is rather than receiving the ball in the same space 
you should be in a different space because that creates an angle. The ball comes to you on an angle and your body is open to it, which allows you to make a one-touch shot or allows you to at least manipulate the goalie a little bit more. So from that point of view, the goal, the forward moves over to the half space uh, to receive the ball from the goalkeeper. That's option one. Option two is that their forward actually stays with ours, right? And that would equate to, in the game, uh, a center mid uh, moving back and being a part of the defensive line, which happens a lot in a 4-3-3. The defensive line comes back and splits the two defenders and creates a back line of five, right? So that's how you can go from a 4-3-3 into a 5-2-3, or a 5-4-1, which is how uh, a lot of professional teams that play 4-3-3 defend. The other option is it could just be the weak side center defender that comes in to pick up the player. So that so this happens again in the game. Either way, let's say the forward drops back and is goal side of our forward. What that now does is that creates space in our half for the forward to receive the ball so they're going to show for the ball in our space within the same space the center space and now what we have here is we should have a 3v2 when the forward makes that run why because again the wingers are man marking so let's say the two wingers can't get open so what happens now is our forward drops back to receive that ball Once they receive the ball, this is when our rondos come into play. Our two wingers should at this point try and go into uh, the spaces, right? And lose their defender in the wide space. That's one option. That's the simple option, okay? That's essentially a second man run. However, what we want to create is a third man run. So here's how we do that. A third man run in my head at least, works like this. The ball is passed from the same space. So the goalkeeper is in the center space, the forward is in the center space. The forward receives the ball from the center space, which both the players are currently in. At that point, what's going to happen is everyone is going to get small. So the opposing forward is going to start to press. The defensive team is going to move into the half space at that point now we've essentially released our wingers from the pressure and what we can do now is we can bring the ball back to the same space and then the goalkeeper right or the center mid now has the two wingers who are open to receive the ball in the wide space and they can either receive it in a support position or what we would really like is a ball over the top or in between the two, the winger and the forward to release our players into the other player's half in space. And essentially, that's a breakaway. I'm going to go through that again because that's complicated. And I don't know how good of a job I did. So let's go through that again. Okay. The teams start <clears throat> from uh, a diamond. Okay. Okay. Our, stro- our left side, <clears throat> excuse me, our left and right side wingers are in the wide space. Our goalkeeper center space, our forward center space. The other team is now going man for man. So the winger attacks our winger. The other winger attacks our other winger. And now what we have is we have a 1v1 on each of the wide spaces. Our forward goes up into the other player's half. So essentially, this is where we want them to be in what's what I would call an offside position, if this is our forward. And what they're looking for is to see how the other team reacts to it. If the other team lets them stay offside, which means that the forward doesn't push back and gets goal-sided, then the idea is, can we go into a half space onside to receive the ball and you'll see this a lot with 
forwards. You'll see them staying in that offside position. And in a moment, they'll find the half space by retreating back into the same line as the uh, the offside trap, where the offside trap would be, or uh, the defensive line to receive the ball. But in this example, the defender doesn't want him to be offside. So he goes back, which opens up the center space for our player. The forward then checks in. And they have to do this very quickly. And they have to do this with speed. And it has to be a long check-in. Because a short one won't give us enough time. As they do that, the ball is passed to that forward. Which in turn gets everyone to focus on the ball and shift towards the center space. Forcing the two wide space players on the defensive team to move into the half space freeing up our wingers in the wide space. The ball then goes back to the same space, center, and now what we've been able to do is free our wingers to either receive the ball in a support position to attack, or what's more ideal would be for the wingers to push up and the ball to come over the top. And at that point as well, you'll have the defensive line, the player who's in that um, in that offside trap, allowing our winger to make that run and have space in between the player that was marking them and the player that was just in uh, that was just marking the forward. So the other team is essentially in a triangle defensive shape. And because they're in a triangle defensive shape, there is space in between the player in the half space and the center space. And that's where we want that ball to go. Another name for that ball would be a through ball in between the, their forward and their uh, wide space player. That's how to get into their half. That's how to get into the final third. That's how we do that. Now that we're in there is actually the toughest part. What I've been most frustrated with throughout our season so far is we've been great with our 1v1s. Our tactics have been decent, I think. Players understanding the formations is getting better. But what I haven't really been impressed with is once we get into the final third, what do we do? How do we score a goal? How do we get into that position? So this is where the final third comes in. So the idea is to attack from the wing. That's our philosophy. We want to receive the ball in the wing, and then we want to attack towards the net. As soon as the player who receives the ball in the wing has the ball, that means that the weak side player has to make a run towards the far post. That's what we want. We want our forward, who is now in a supportive position, to stay in that supportive position for a cutback. Okay? So we're dribbling with the wide space towards the half space, towards the front post. At that moment, that player has a decision to make. They can either take a shot towards the far post. They can either do a move to bring him into the center space to shoot the ball into the far post. They can cross the ball in between the 8 and the 16-yard box for our weak side player to come in and score. Or they can dribble down the line into the half space for a cutback for our forward to receive it to shoot the ball. Those are their options. And the whole idea is how do we get the ball to the winger so the winger can attack. And again, all eyes are always on the ball. Even at the highest level, you'll see... Let's talk about this this week's games with... Uh, with England, that ball that was passed by Kane to Foden, no one was on him. No one was paying attention to him. As soon as I saw Kane receiving that ball, I was looking at Foden. That's how, first of all, you should be watching soccer. You should never watch the ball if you're watching soccer on TV. That's not how you analyze teams. That's what, First of all, let me make that point quickly. If anyone ever tells you soccer is boring to watch, that is why. It's because they're not watching it right. They're watching the ball. They're not 
watching everything else. There's 22 players on the field. To watch one makes no sense, and that's boring. You're watching the ball go back and forth. That's not how you watch soccer. Anyway, the ball goes to the winger. The winger attacks. All eyes are on the winger, and now you have two other options. Ideally, you would have the goalkeeper or the center mid now because these are now our forwards coming in to support, and that's your extra line of help. And in the 11v11 game, when we play 4-3-3, those players are the attacking mids that would come into support. So that's maybe when we would start to play um, 5v5. Sorry, 6v6. Okay, That's a really good way to introduce that 11v11 because it's kind of the same thing. So that's attack. Okay. Now, there's a whole other part to this, and that's defense on defense the way that i start out and this is where we are right now we're at the very basic level because we just started this what i want is two things at the beginning i want you to pick the player that's playing the opposite of your position and the second thing is that i want you to always on defense stay in between him and your net that's it that's part one that's the most simple way to defend okay i pick a player i'm always in between them and the net so that way i know that if a pass comes i'm going to be there to block it where it gets a little bit more complicated is once you start introducing shifting half spaces so if i introduce that when the ball is on one wide space the weak side player shifts to the half space then it becomes more complicated because now you're not really just worried about the player. You're worried about the ball in the wide space. So then you have to start to swivel your head and what we introduce as knee to knee. One knee towards the ball, one knee towards the player. So that's where things get a little bit more complicated. On top of that, you can start to introduce defensive lines, right? So you can start to say things like, as soon as we lose the ball, I want my two wingers back in our half in the half space, and I want them in the line, okay? Because that gets them ready for offside traps. So those are three parts, and it takes a while from part one to get to part two, part two to part three. And all those are effective and have different uses throughout different types of games, right? So depending on the opponent, we can say things like man-to-man, -man. We can say things like offside trap. We can say things like shift, right? These are all different types and ways to defend, right? We can call shifting maybe zonal defending, right? And we can call all these things and introduce them uh, in a defensive way that really allows you to be flexible within your defensive shape. Now, this is kind of what I figured out so far. The idea here is to empower the players, right allow them to play in quick small environments that the game speed is so high that once we get into the real game it just becomes easy that's what we're looking at we're looking at a lot of 1v1s we're looking at receiving the ball combinations we're looking at shooting the ball far post runs okay support there are so many things that are going on here and this is just the entry level. So as a coach now, it's my job to watch my players, just like we do with our 1v1s. Watch the players, see how they interact in this environment. What are they really struggling with? Most of the time at the younger ages, it's defense, right? They're gonna lose their man. They're not gonna be knee to knee, okay? It's just, that's not going to happen. Oh, sorry, I forgot one thing on offense as well. You can also do give and go. So if uh, your forward uh, goes up and then drops in to receive the ball, uh, and sorry, the winger instead receives the ball, not the, uh, the forward, then uh, the forward shifts into the half space, give and go, and then now we're attacking and have beaten the player. So the idea, again, is get the ball to the wide space on offense, attack in the wide space, from the wide space, we want to attack towards the half space or make runs or make passes uh, 
that get us into the danger zone, which is essentially the box or just outside the box. Well, thanks for listening to another episode of Coaching Soccer Weekly. This weekend I have all of my teams are playing, so we have three games on Saturday and one game on Sunday, and I will talk about those as I do at the beginning of next week's show. Our Coaching Soccer Weekly Facebook group is doing really well. We're at 84 members, which I'm pretty proud of. Uh, Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to try and stay out of things and really not uh, talk there. This is more for the listeners, for you guys to make connections and ask questions and stuff like that and get different perspectives because all you do is hear me talk. So (laughs) I don't think you want to hear so much more from me. So uh, if you want to join, just look up Coaching Soccer Weekly on Facebook. I'm going to be in Israel at the end of December, early January. So if you want to connect, uh, feel free to send me an email. Uh, I'll be there visiting some extended family. Um, But other than that, enjoy the journey, enjoy the moments, but most importantly, enjoy the World Cup. Coaching Soccer Weekly is a production of World Class Coaching. All rights reserved. Hey, thanks for watching all the way to the end. And you can check out more of our videos right here. And if you haven't done so already, I would really appreciate it if you'd hit the like button and the subscribe button.